thank you guys so much for coming. Who has never been to a startup grind? I know we have a number. Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming. So this is run by The Conductor, which is a partnership between the University of Central Arkansas and Startup Junkie. We exist to catalyze the entrepreneurial ecosystem in, um, in Central Arkansas. So really happy that you're here. We have a delegation from Africa here with us tonight. So um, I'm a proud member of the Global Ties to Arkansas board. And um, through that, we're able to reach people all over the world. Um, so they're here um, working on empowering youth and kind of creating jobs for, for youth in, in Africa. So uh, we actually have a French translator here with us tonight. So thank you for coming. I want to give a quick thanks to the conductor team, um, Jeff, Kaylin, Dylan, and especially Dylan and Kaylin um, are in the final uh, stretch of school right now. Kaylin, I think, is, has one more week of classes, and Dylan defended his thesis yesterday. So thank you guys for making this happen in the midst of all of that. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is about a 40-minute Q&A, and then I'm going to open up to audience Q&A. So write down what you're thinking, tweet or post um, the fantastic things that Mike's going to say tonight, and let people know about the conductor and Conway. So we're going to get started. Mike is the executive director of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. Um, really, really um, fantastic person. I've been really excited about having you here with us tonight and talking about all the amazing things you do. He also loves basketball um, and loves Arkansas, which I love. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Could you just tell us about yourself? Where did you go to college? Where did you grow up? Sure. And I guess the mic's working. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. And, and Kim, thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to, uh, to come and be with you guys tonight. I know uh, Charles Morgan was the guest speaker last month. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, the day after Charles uh, uh, did this event, uh, he and I are, are on a board together. And uh, we met at his office. And he was still so fired up about the event and getting to meet everyone. Uh, and he just couldn't say enough good things. So I told him, I said, oh, I got big shoes to fill anytime mm -hmm. I go behind Charles Morgan. So. Uh, uh, wonderful guy, but uh, Kim, again, thanks for having me. So, um, I, uh, I grew up in uh, Florida. I uh, went to school at the University of Florida. Uh, I won't, I'll refrain from doing the gator chomp or yelling, go Gators, too loud. But uh, since coming to Arkansas, I've uh, adopted the Razorbacks as my SEC West team. So, I have an SEC East and SEC West yeah. team. So, you know, I can I root for both. Um, but I, I was recruited here in uh, 2015, shortly after Governor Hutchinson took office, uh, to lead his economic development team. I had been doing economic development in Florida uh, for a number of years, and uh, Governor, after got elected, you know, wanted to make economic development one of his uh, priorities and, and key pieces of his his administration. So uh, he hired a uh, headhunting uh, firm uh, to find someone to lead economic development, and uh, somehow my name ended up on on that list, and. Um, uh, I got a call. It was actually uh, my wife and I had been married for all of about two months at that point, and uh, we were lying on a beach in Isle Morada, which is down in the Keys in, in Florida, at a friend's wedding. And I get this call, and I take it, and I go back to my wife, and I said, "How would you feel about moving to Arkansas?" And she <laughs> said, "Well, you got to point that out on a map to me." So. Uh, <laughs> Once we established that, uh, about uh, two weeks later, uh, the governor um, uh, flew me in. And actually, the first time in Arkansas was uh, someone picked me up at the airport and drove me to the governor's mansion. And uh, I, next thing I know, I was interviewing with the governor and his chief of staff for uh, uh, this position. And then about two weeks later, I was uh, blessed enough for him to uh, call me back and say, we'd like to have you in Arkansas. So uh, we shortly after that, we packed our things up and bought a house in Little Rock and uh, haven't looked back. So awesome. Here we are today. Cool. I wanted to get into that a little bit, okay. um, but before that, I've read in numerous articles where you say that Arkansas feels like home. You and Ann both say that, and you mm -hmm. just love Arkansas. Can you just talk about that? I mean, that's a that is a major transition from lying on the beach in Florida <laughs> to moving to Arkansas. I, it is uh, the, the biggest transition was losing that beach. That was that's kind of hard, you know, being close to it, but. Uh, where I grew up in Florida, most people think Florida, uh, I've learned that people in Arkansas think Florida, they think of uh, Destin to Panama City. That's where everyone in, in, in Arkansas tends to go to the beach. I grew up in um, uh, kind of north central Florida, so uh, in the center part of the state. So uh, the beaches I went to were on the you know the Atlantic Ocean or uh, in the St. Petersburg area in southwest Florida. My wife is from Fort Myers, which is uh, far southwest Florida, but uh, where I grew up is very rural. Uh, it's a, a part of uh, Florida, I think it's actually one of the nor most northern counties in the state borders Georgia. So uh, to me, Arkansas was very similar to the area that I grew up in. I mean, m 
my first job uh, putting, you know, going through high school was selling boiled peanuts on the side of the road. So, I mean, it's very rural, very agricultural driven, uh, you know, kind of a, a one factory town. And, and I saw the impacts when the, a, a factory shut down and what the impact of that had, in, uh, you know, on a community that, that I lived in. So uh, that was kind of always in the back of my mind when I was going through school and working in politics about how do you, you know, help create jobs in a, in a community because I saw what it, it affected a small community like where I grew up in. So uh, it, it feels like home being in Arkansas. There's a lot of similarities to it. Awesome. So can you talk about your, your professional kind of journey into this job and where did mm -hmm. you start? Um, so as I said, I went to University of Florida and um, uh, while I was still in school, I actually started working in the political process and worked for a state house member. Uh, so I would go to class in, in the mornings and then um, uh, by the afternoon time I was running the district office for this uh, state legislator. Uh, that legislator actually went on to become the Speaker of the House for the state of Florida. So uh, I kind of followed him up uh, uh, in the political process and uh, went from the House over to the Senate, became a Chief of Staff for a, a Senator once I finally uh, got my degree and graduated. Um, I had all intentions of going to law school as a political science major, so it's like, what do you do after you get a poli-sci degree? Uh, you either hunt for a job or you go to law school. And I was fortunate enough to actually have a job in, uh, in politics, so I was like, you know, this was always my end game to go through law school is to get into politics, but I was doing it, so I really liked it. But uh, when I was working in the Senate, uh, we represented a very rural part of northern Florida, and, and as I said, this is kind of where I grew up, and I saw the impact of what jobs would mean to a community. Uh, so I started working on economic development issues for the senator uh, and started working with local chambers of commerce, economic development groups. Uh, the University of Florida actually was in our district as well, so uh, doing some research and development with them, trying to uh, turn it into commercializing that that was coming out of the university. Uh, and just really fell in love with economic development. So I was fortunate enough then to, to get a call from uh, what would be the equivalent of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission in Florida. It's called the Enterprise Florida there. They had a position open to, to head up their government relations uh, division. So uh, I jumped at the opportunity and uh, six and a half years later and a couple of governors uh, just loved what I was doing in economic development. And then when I got the, the call from, from Arkansas and met with Governor Hutchinson, I saw his passion for economic development. I saw what he brought to the table and said, you know, it really takes leadership at the top to be effective in economic development and to, uh, you know, to score the wins that you need to, to move the state forward. And I saw the commitment that this governor had and said, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to uh, be asked to have this position, I need to take it. So mm. kind of how I got to Arkansas. Awesome. So can you talk about kind of demystify what the Arkansas Economic Development Commission is and what you do? <laughs> So, as everybody thinks, we just have a big pot of money that we just dole out to anyone that comes along. <laughs> all, right, all right, let's line up and we'll pass out checks. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that, but you got to kind of think of us almost, as I say, as a, as a de facto Department of Commerce, because uh, obviously, you know, we get most of our attention for business recruitment and retention. We go out and recruit industries to Arkansas, we recruit companies to, to come uh, to our state or our, help our existing companies to, to grow and to expand here. And that is kind of the, the meat and heart of what we do, but beyond that, we have an existing business uh, resource division where we work with our existing businesses, where we have a manufacturing solutions uh, group who goes out, who works with manufacturers to teach them uh, uh, lean, uh, uh, lean Six Sigma, uh, uh, Toyota Kata, to help manufacturers to be better in what they do and be more proficient and, and find efficiencies in the organization. We have the Office of Film, so any films that are coming into, into the state, we're charged with recruiting them, working with them, helping them find the talent. Uh, True Detective Season 3 recently aired on HBO, filmed in Northwest Arkansas. We worked with HBO to recruit that project here. Uh, even though the plot line was set in uh, Northwest Arkansas, Georgia was fighting very hard to get them to film there. They can make you know, Georgia look just about anywhere. Uh, the show Ozark on, on uh, Netflix is actually, you know, it's supposed to be set in, in the Ozarks in Missouri. It's filmed in Georgia. Uh, so we wanted True Detective to, about Arkansas to be filmed right in northwest Arkansas. So we have the film office with, uh, under our purview. We have the Department of Rural Services. This used to be a standalone uh, division uh, that's now within our organization. So we help rural communities to, to build out infrastructure and, and um, uh, support them through some grant programs. We have what used to be the Arkansas Science and Technology Authority, so we do have some grant funding through, through that, through our SBIR programs and some matching grants funds that we have to help small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, to, uh, to help them get started and get going. Um, 
we have our community development block grant, we have all of our HR back office type of uh, uh, issues, we have community developers who work very closely with uh, local economic developers, uh, building capacity in our community. So our umbrella is, is very wide. Um, you know, we're getting ready to uh, uh, be merged into what will become a Department of Commerce thanks to the governor's transformation bill. So uh, our role and in, in responsibilities could you know, expand beyond that and we'll have additional you know, opportunities through the Department of Commerce hopefully uh, to bring in more. But it's kind of a high level overview of what AEDC is and, and what we do. And what about what do you, what do you, what's a typical day for you? <laughs> I don't know if there is if such there is a, one. if there is such one as a typical day. And one thing I left out too is is you know we we represent the state and, and we try to bring businesses in here to the state, but ultimately when a, in a business locates in our state, they they end up in a community and they have to call a community home. So we rely heavily on our local economic development partners. So uh, you know the Conway Chamber of Commerce and I appreciate you being here tonight on behalf of, of the of, of the chamber. We work with them very closely to make sure that you know that they have a professional team in place that can work with the consultants or work with a company, uh, that they have uh, sites available, that they have buildings available. Because ultimately we want them to go to a community, we want them to be there, be happy and thrive because we're going to see a lot of our growth through these companies that are already here and helping them eventually grow. So can you dig into that for a second? Mm -hmm. So how, do you, how does quality of place, quality of life and all these communities around the state play into your job? Sure. And I guess I didn't finish your, your part of your first question, one's a typical day. There's really oh. not a, a typical day. So uh, just today I started this morning, um, I had, did an interview with Roby Brock, who does a talk business politics, uh, has a Sunday morning show. So we taped the Sunday morning show uh, this morning in, in, in the studio. From there I went to Fort Smith and there's the Arkansas uh, Aerospace and uh, Aerospace and Defense Alliance annual summit was going on so the governor and I were the speakers at that uh, in Fort Smith this afternoon from there I came back here in with you guys this <laughs> evening tomorrow at 8 30 I'll be in Camden Arkansas uh, announcing a uh, an expansion of a company called Aerojet Rocketdyne which actually makes the THAAD missiles if anyone's you know familiar with the defense industry THAAD missiles are actually made in Camden, Arkansas. Most people don't realize that. So this company is, is expanding, adding about 140 jobs, and we're doing the, uh, the groundbreaking ceremony for, for their facility there. Uh, when I finish that, I will go from there to Helena, Arkansas, and we're announcing a project in Helena where there's been a, a, a shuttered uh, sawmill. It's been closed for a number of years that has recently been bought by a Chinese company, and they're getting ready to employ 75 people uh, back at the sawmill. So. Uh, Clap to that. 70, yeah, 75 jobs in Helena is like 2,000 jobs in Little Rock. I mean, that's, that's a big deal for, for a community like Helena. Uh, and then I'll come back to Little Rock tomorrow night, and then Friday I'll be in West Memphis speaking at a um, Delta Grassroots Caucus uh, organization. So any given day or week, I'm pretty much in all corners of the state. Um, a lot of international travel as well, which we can probably uh, talk about at some mm -hmm. point. So. You asked about quality of life, and, and I apologize to my interpreter here. I realize I'm going really fast. I'll try to <laughs> slow down. I just try to interpret everything into French, so uh, I'll let you catch your breath for a second. Um, quality of life does matter. Um, you know, for, for years, and, and I think it, you're seeing a generational shift. For, you know, generations before the current ones, their mindset is, I'm going to go somewhere and find a job. And where I find that job, I'm going to put down roots, and that's where I'm going to live and be happy, and uh, you know, I'll raise my family there and, and stay there for a long time. The newer generations, millennials, the Generation Y coming after that, their mindset's completely different. It's about quality of life. That's what's number one to them. They're going to go somewhere where they want to be happy, that they have a vibrant downtown, that they can bike to the coffee shop, that they can, you know, check out the local microbreweries and, and have bike trails and do all the, the cool things that, you know, make them happy. And then they'll find a job. The job's second to them. It's more about that happiness and quality of life. So for the longest, we'd always look at the uh, site selection consultants we work with very closely in our, in, our, in our world, and they kind of have their top rankings. What are the things that you look at? And obviously, you know, work for, available workforce, tax structure, uh, access to capital. These things are, you know, always in their top five. And traditionally, that list hasn't changed. But in the last three to four years, the top five now sees quality of life. And every year, you start seeing that notch up just a little bit more. So quality of life is, is very important. We, um, 
announced a very large project yesterday in, in Little Rock, uh, nearly 600 jobs. And the, uh, the, uh, the chairman of the company was speaking yesterday. And a lot went into it, but one of the things that he mentioned is what he fell in love with Little Rock is it's a, uh, the company is called CZ. It's a, a, a gun manufacturer out of the Czech Republic. Um, and this is their first uh, uh, North American manufacturing and, and corporate headquarters that they're going to have. Um, he, obviously, we, a lot goes back into it, but his comment was, I really fell in love with, with Little Rock when I realized that, one, there was a, a Czech restaurant in Little Rock that served Czech beer on tap. And then the next morning, I got up and rode my bike on a trail. And this guy's an avid bike rider. Mm. He said, those three things made me fall in love with Little Rock. We were very skeptical coming here. They had hired a site selection consultant uh, to start this process. They looked at several southern states, and the consultant said, you need to consider Arkansas. Why don't you go there? And he didn't know, didn't know anything about us. And um, fortunately for, for us and for that announcement yesterday, he came here. And we put that together. We knew he was coming from the check. All right, we're going to take him to the pantry. It's a Czech-owned <laughs> restaurant. We gave the, re the owner a heads up, and he came out and spoke to him in, in Czech and, uh, and, and loved it. And part of it was that um, the business case made a lot of sense here. We you know, put together a great package for him, but then we had to sell his family. We had to sell his wife and his two teenage boys that Little Rock was going to be a cool place to live. And granted, they're coming from Prague. Mm. Yeah. They've been living in Kansas City now the last couple of years, so it's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a change. But we were able to sell that, and quality of life played such a big role in that. Cool. Can you talk about the whole idea of, of selling Arkansas? So I'm really intrigued by this, and, mm -hmm. and rebranding Arkansas as Arkansas Inc. And, and right. Can you talk about that just in general, but also how that plays out in your international travel? You know, so I've always said since being here, and I think I can, you know, as an outsider, kind of come in and, and say, you know, here's the perception, and here's what, you know, being here and knowing what's, what's reality. And to me, we haven't done a good job of selling what's reality. We've just kind of, you know, been, uh, you know, amenable to, to, hey, life is what it is, and we'll get companies if they come. I want us to be more proactive and tell the story about Arkansas. The perception is, you know, uh, we're all barefoot and we don't have Wi-Fi. Well, I think everyone's wearing <laughs> shoes here tonight, and my Wi-Fi was working fine in town. So, you know, we got to overcome that perception issue that, you know, we're not just this sleepy southern state. We got a lot going for us. Everyone knows that Walmart's here. Everyone knows that we've had a president that's from here. We've got to build on that. Use those things to leverage us, you know, all over the world. The Fulbright Scholarship Program. Senator Fulbright was from here. You won't believe how many times we travel internationally and people were sitting in a boardroom in, you know, Tokyo or Shanghai or Berlin and someone says, Oh, I was a Fulbright scholar. I know all about the University of Arkansas. We gotta to play to those things to make sure that people know it. So We've tried to really rebrand ourselves, and we've rebrand ourselves as a business destination. So we have the tagline, Arkansas Inc. So we want people to think that Arkansas is a business. And we want businesses to think that, you know, when you're coming and dealing with us, it's like dealing with a business rather than dealing with a, a small state government. Now, we're going to be fast. We're going to be nimble. We're going to be reactive to whatever a business needs. So trying to get that message in front of, you know, CEOs all over the world, throughout our country, site selection consultants, uh, it's taken time, but we're starting to see the, the fruits of that labor start to pay off with projects like we were able to announce yesterday. Fantastic. Can you talk a little about um, entrepreneurship? And, and before I ask, I would mm -hmm. remiss if I didn't say that because of the AEDC and the Accelerator Grant, uh, the conductor is able to offer our 10x growth accelerator, which um, helps scale Arkansas-based businesses. We actually have um, uh, 10x graduates in the back there. All right. um, can you talk about the importance of that to the AEDC and, mm -hmm. and cultivating and growing businesses within the state? Sure. So when I look at job growth and, and, and how we grow our economy, I try to break it down into, into three buckets. You have what I call competitive projects. So that's like the, the, the Czech uh, company that we recruited yesterday, where we were actually competing head to head with, with other states. I won't share with, with who, but there were several other southern states that we, we beat out. We won that project. We had to use incentives to get them here, but they're here. They're going to make this investment. That's the, the competitive projects. You have organic and market-driven growth. Organic market-driven growth is we're a natural market. We have 3 million people here. There's going to be businesses that want to come here and service us as a market. What are we doing, you know, as, in terms of a state and local government to improve on that? We're cutting taxes. We're reducing regulations. We're helping it 
to be is easier for a business. That's that organic and market driven growth. In the middle of that, I call it consider facilitated growth. And this is where, you know, I think for too long we've, we've missed things like entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship to me would fit into this bucket. And this is where a state or a community makes a conscientious decision to invest. And then we can see some type of return. So that was something when I came to AEDC, I said, we want to do more to be able to invest in, into entrepreneurship. So um, we have the accelerator program now. We have the Science and Technology Authority within, uh, within our agency now. So we can actually start to make investments in small startup type companies, you know, whether it be through an accelerator or other opportunities. Because usually you know, when we're dealing with you know, recruitment, uh, we're using tax dollars. So the legislature, they want to see a return on that tax dollar. If a company fails, man, it comes back on us and I got to go in front of legislative audit and get my teeth kicked in, why would you give this company money? What we're trying to do is change that mindset and realize in entrepreneur world, you're going to fail. There's not every company is going to be the next, you know, big hit. So we need to make sure that we have funds available that we're investing that, you know, realizing that not everyone's going to hit, but those ones that do hit are going to be the ones that carry us. So we're now investing in that facilitated growth area and may, we as a state now have made that conscientious decision to invest in these areas and we're starting to see the returns from it. Because really, you know, the biggest companies in the world, Walmart, Facebook, Google, started out as young entrepreneurs with an idea and have grown into these massive companies and that's what we need to see more of and how can we help foster that growth in the state. So uh, I really commend communities like Conway that have taken upon themselves to invest in it as well for what you and, and your team, Kim, what you guys do and partnering with us is so important. So uh, we're slowly <coughs> moving the needle. We got a long ways to go to catch up with an Austin, Texas or you know Silicon Valley. But um, take note because I think Central Arkansas is, is, is going to be fast and furious as, it, as we continue to grow in this, this arena. Thank you. I need to, to pause for a second and just say too that that is not trivial, the state's investment mm -hmm. in, in entrepreneurship and you know I was just telling you the other day um, I speak on international and national stages about the importance of, of the governor's um, initiatives in that mm -hmm. regard and in your investment in entrepreneurship because that is abnormal. You do not normally have that kind of buy-in from the state, so it's really incredible. We would never have that in Florida, guarantee that. They're, they're skeptical of us <laughs> in economic development to have any money, so uh, for the legislature and the governor to give us those tools and resources, it says a lot about the leadership that we have in our state. Definitely. What what would be the first step for an entrepreneur to take to, to seek out investment from from the AEDC and, and how would they, because I feel like, how would they know that they're even the right candidate for that? You know, and, and, and I'd say utilize our team because you would you'd be surprised the ideas we have come walk through our door and sometimes it's, you know, hey, you guys got a long ways to go, but what I feel is we've got a, a strong team of professionals who are very good at evaluating, you know, young talent and ideas, so uh, typically what we'll do is we'll sit down with them, we'll hear them out, show us your business plan, here are the things that you need to do and the steps that you need to take. And honestly, the answer might be no, but we'll give you some feedback and say, hey, you're missing here, here's where we see you know, holes in your idea, but if you can't get it through us, then how are you gonna get it through you know, the, the financial investors who are, who are coming from you know, New York City or Chicago to fund your idea if you can't you know, work with us? So I'd say start with us, you know, and don't always go in there just saying if we get told no that it's the end of the world, use that as a learning experience. So if you have an idea and you're starting to, to you know, formulate something, you put it to, to pencil and paper and you've got a solid business plan and you think you're at the point that you're actually gonna start asking and raising money, come talk to us. You know, we might not be able to help right now, but we can help you get in that right direction and say, get all these boxes checked and then come back to talk to us and then we're going to see what we can do for you. And uh, Jeff Sandridge in the back there is, is on the ASTA board, aren't you? So it would be a great resource to contact about that too. So you, you'll go in front of Jeff and, and that team and, and they, they go through careful evaluations and they'll make a recommendation to, to me if they, they think that something's worthy. So. Uh, you guys get a lot of good good ideas that come through and some that you know we, we kick back to them but that's all it's part of the process and sometimes they go back and then they come back to us that's right yeah awesome can we talk a little bit about professional development slash advice and um, I really think your career trajectory is is impressive mm -hmm. and what do you attribute that to I mean you're in this world and and can you speak to maybe being 
uh, are you one of the youngest people in your in your position in the industry and, and mm -hmm. why do you think that is so I was um, uh, 31 when uh, the governor recruited me to, to come here I know I've, I've aged like 10 years in the last four years so <laughs> um, uh, and at the time yes I was the youngest uh, head of economic development for a state in the country I think I don't think that's changed I think I still am so I had uh, my leg up on, on quite a few but um, what would I attribute that to? I think it's, you know, uh, hard work and determination. I, I think, you know, starting on that path in college and realizing, hey, I want to be involved in this at a young age and, uh, you know, I don't want to say, you know, don't take away anything from the time you have in college and, you know, enjoy yourself in college too, but I realized if I'm going to get on this path, I need to do it early. So that's why when I was in college, I started working in the legislative process and just, making connections. I think uh, who you know uh, makes a big difference. Um, the headhunting firm that the governor hired, um, I had met along the way in Florida. They actually tried to hire me away from where I was to go on to another job. And I didn't say no. I said, sure, I'll entertain it. I ended up uh, not doing the job that they had originally searched for, but I built a relationship. And because I had that relationship with that headhunter, uh, when he got hired for this, he said, man, let me call Mike and see if, if he'd be interested. And thankfully my wife said, yeah, okay, let's check it out. And so I was able to say, yeah, go ahead and su submit the, uh, my resume. So uh, build relationships. Uh, relationships uh, still matter. Um, I know this probably sounds trivial and uh, people are, you know, cliche a little bit, but first impressions matter too, mm -hmm. especially in economic development. And we tell this to a lot of our communities. When we're bringing a company into our state or into your community, they fly in, they drive into town, they look around. What do they see? That first impression matters. So it matters when you're you know, bringing a company in, but it also matters when you go to meet somebody and you have those conversations. So uh, you know, always put your best foot forward when you're meeting someone for the first time. It, it certainly helps. Awesome. And what about leadership? Can you speak to just management and leadership and that side of your mm -hmm. work? Yeah. So. Um, Obviously, when I when I came in at 31, and not only was I one of the youngest, you know, uh, leaders in my position in the country, I was one of the youngest people at, at, at the organization I was getting ready to, to take on. So uh, I had to really, you know, quickly earn and build the trust of the team, uh, and I was able to do that by coming in and not, you know, necessarily saying, "Hey, I know everything, and this is how we're going to do it." I said, "You guys have been here for a while. Tell me what you know has been working. What can we do differently?" And I really come at it as a team approach. So uh, I have an executive team. I have uh, and, uh, three executive vice presidents, uh, one of operations, one of global business, and one of marketing communications. Um, and we meet at least once a week. We bring everyone together. We share ideas. We, you know, we have a closed door meeting. We say everything is on the table. You know, tell me if it's a good idea, bad idea. But when we leave this room, we all agree and we're all on the same page. So I think bringing that people to the table, making sure that you hear everyone's voice and you guys kind of build a consensus and come out, uh, that really helps. And then, you know, leaning on our, our division directors. So I, I mentioned a little bit of the divisions. We have 14 divisions total at, at the Economic Development Commission. I try to get together with them once a week, too, and get their feedback. So I don't want to, you know, make it feel like it's a, a, it's a top-down leadership approach that you will do this. No, tell me what your team's doing and where I can come in and support that. And I think I've been able to then build the trust of the team and uh, have a good relationship with all my folks. Awesome. Okay, I have a couple more questions before we open it up. Okay. Um, so, you've had a major life change in the last six months. You're a new dad. Three can months. You, three months. <laughs> can you talk about um, about that and that journey? Yeah, so uh, um, uh, first time father of a three and a half month old now. So, if I look like I haven't slept since then, it's because I haven't. <laughs> uh, and, and I apologize once it hits seven o'clock, I'm at the uh, uh, slip out and uh, relieve the nanny and take over. I realize once you have a kid, uh, you don't run your own schedule anymore. The, <laughs> the, the child does. But, uh, um, you know, and, and not to get into to too many personal details, but it, it was a journey for my wife and I. We, we tried for a, a long time to start a family, and uh, it, it didn't work for us. And, um, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a blow to, to not be able to. Uh, so uh, try to make a long story as short as I can. But uh, we went to a, a fertility doctor in, in, in Little Rock, and uh, started going through a, a, a process and um, uh, tested my wife for genetic uh, diseases to see if she was a carrier before we started going through IVF, which is in vitro fertilization. Um, and uh, her blood work came back that she was a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And she's, you know, 
do you have any history of this in your family? You know, no, you know, as a carrier, you don't have any symptoms. And the doctor said, well, don't worry. In order for it to affect your child, you would, uh, your husband would also have to be a carrier. And your odds of that are, you know, one in 600. So I tested my blood, and sure enough, we were the lucky one in 600. So came back that I, too, was a carrier for cystic fibrosis. And again, you know, no symptoms, no, no family history whatsoever. So, and not to get too much in the, 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 uh, biology of this, but that meant then our child would have a one in four chance of having cystic fibrosis. Um, so we decided to go through, uh, continue on with the IVF and vitro fertilization because then they can actually screen an embryo before they uh, uh, move forward with it. Um, well, long story short, the uh, IVF didn't work for us. We went through two years of that. If anyone, know anyone that's gone through that, it's a very expensive, kind of painful process. Uh, and each time that it didn't work just was, was more and more gut-wrenching to us. So we started seeing a specialist in Colorado and we we're going to take an, uh, another step and, and we had a, a one-month window uh, before we were going down to uh, back to Colorado to, to try again and uh, we actually got pregnant on our own. So, uh, um, which was, was exciting uh, and also terrifying because we didn't go through IVF. We got mm -hmm. pregnant naturally, which meant our child would have a one in four chance of, of having cystic fibrosis. So uh, it was a scary uh, nine months and then uh, uh, first initial two weeks of our, our child's life uh, because we had to wait for all the blood work to get back. They mapped our DNA and had to compare it against his, but uh, he is healthy. He does not have cystic fibrosis. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, uh, he is certainly a miracle. It was a blessing in our life, and uh, uh, we're, we're just you know, thankful to God every single day that, that it turned out the way it did. Before we even knew that we were pregnant or, or went down that road, we started volunteering with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and have met uh, people uh, that, that have kids with CF. We've met adults who are living with CF. They've made so many great strides in it. So uh, uh, our, my wife and I were the honorees last year for the Arkansas Cystic Fibrosis Breath of Life Gala. Uh, we helped them raise more money than they ever have. Uh, last year, we actually doubled their fundraising efforts from the year before, doubled their attendance for the gala. And, uh, we stay committed. We're now on the board for the Arkansas Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and um, will always be near and dear to our hearts. So, uh, my son is a carrier of my genetic mutation, so we did find that out. So, you know, there's a chance he could pass it along if, if he ends up marrying someone with it that also has a, is a, a carrier. But we know that, so we can, you know, teach him about it. But uh, they're close to a cure, and we certainly hope they find it in our lifetime. But it's been a, it's been a journey for us, and certainly life-changing and eye-opening. But um, uh, we're thankful, and that's kind of one of the things where you realize that you're in a good community and a good place. Um, we don't have any family here. It's just my wife and I, all of our families back in Florida. But the support we had from, uh, we call it our Little Rock family, our Arkansas family, it was just amazing through that whole process. Our friends, uh, they stepped up for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. They were there for us the entire way through the, you know, through the length of the pregnancy. And um, uh, the governor and first lady, I can't say enough about them and uh, them being for us there. So uh, it's been a journey. Well, but, uh, we now have uh, Pierce Paul Preston, uh, call him P3 for short. <laughs> and uh, he is, it was born January 8th, so he shares a birthday with Elvis and Kim Jong Un. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that, and um, yeah, I mean, I even told you this, I think, before, but, well, I think it's really awesome how you turned it into a, a positive um, way to to bring light to that, to cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. and even, even before... Um, before you had Pierce. Yeah. And I mean, I, I told you this in an email, I think, you know, I, I said a lot of prayers for your baby too. And so, uh, yeah, I just think it's really incredible. And, and you guys did a lot of really good work in that regard. So answered prayer for sure. Um, okay, we have about 30 minutes okay. for questions. Um, not not that much. Yeah, we'll start here. Uh-huh. Uh, first, uh, my name is Richard Bell. I want to say thank you for coming. Yes. Uh, uh, I have two questions. Number one, uh, what follows up on the underground of the Department of Commerce? Mm -hmm. So as the Department of Commerce, so the governor uh, passed legislation this, uh, this past session that's going to re uh, restructure all of state government. So currently he has 42 agency heads, agency directors that report to him. He has restructured state government to where it's going to shrink down to 15. 
So right now we don't have a Department of Commerce, so there will be a Department of Commerce created. What will fall into the Department of Commerce will be the Economic Development Commission, uh, the uh, Arkansas Development Finance Authority, um, the um, Arkansas Waterways Commission, the Airport Authority, um, you're going to have a regulatory side, uh, which will include insurance, banking, securities. Uh, on more of the economic development side, you'll also have the Department of uh, Workforce Services, uh, DWS. And then uh, what used to be the Arkansas Career Education is actually going to be split between about three different areas with the Office of Skills Development going into the Department of Commerce. And there's also a... Uh, uh, what do they call it? Oh, Wine Producers Council. Um, I'm not 100% sure what the Wine Producers Council does, but that'll be uh, part of the uh, Department of Commerce. So that's, uh, it's going to be a, a whole new uh, era for state government. Okay, and uh, for the second question, uh, as, a resident, uh, as a native economy, I'm pretty sure a lot of people here are concerned about the local economy. Uh, what can you tell us about the local economy here in Arkansas? Of course. Uh, like I said, uh, I can't say enough about um, Brad Lacey and the team over at the Conway Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the proactive approach that they have to economic development, uh, I wish I could replicate what's going on in Conway all over the state. Uh, I think that you guys are going to see continued growth. Whenever we talk to a you know consultant or a company, Central Arkansas is on the radar screen, and that, that's something that you know I try not to. You know I know there's Conway, Little Rock, and you know Benton, and Bryant, and, and Sherwood, North Little Rock, for a, CEO that's sitting in, in Paris, mm. he sees central Arkansas. You know, we got to try not to, you know, get worried about, caught up about, you know, between the, the city lines and county lines, but sell ourselves as a region. But that said, Conway, with what you guys have going on the, in the entrepreneurial world, what you have going on with the, the colleges and universities here, and just the talented workforce that you have, and just all overall a beautiful community, I see a lot of potential here. I know we're about to, to see it, the, the closing of Kimberly Clark. That was a, a company that, that we fought to try to keep. Obviously, you know, what we have to offer in incentives was you know, pennies on the dollar to what Wisconsin was offering to the, that facility. So it's unfortunate how that happens, but uh, we look at it as, a, as an opportunity. I mean, there's going to be a new building available that we're going to be able to put some type of manufacturing in. Those people are working at Kimberly Clark, you know, 300 people are skilled in manufacturing. We could turn around and find them a job, you know, tomorrow. But we want to use that facility to, to bring in a new company and diversify the, the economy more. So the uh, the company that I mentioned, the CZ, that announced yesterday in, in, in Little Rock, um, at the end of the press conference that we did, I made a plug for a website that we, we uh, created for a landing page for anyone who is interested in applying for a job. Uh, they could go to this landing page and upload a resume and all their information. So we had the press conference at 10 a.m. yesterday. At 11 p.m. last night when we checked, we had 500 people submit an application mm. looking for a job. So there's people in the central Arkansas area who are looking for, for jobs. So uh, we still have more companies to bring. So, uh, you know, my prospects on Conway are, are very high. You guys are doing the right thing. Next question. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Uh huh. Um, so I have several questions for both of you. One, I wanted a better understanding of how EDC supports Starter Prime because I supported Starter Prime in Kenya and Somalia mm -hmm. for the last few years, so I just wanted to better understand the relationship. Um, I also wanted to understand how you create an enabling environment for startups and entrepreneurs in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, more over, I was at an event called Venture Capital, and they were talking about um, how hard it is to attract funding for startups. So mm -hmm. we see funding with local startups here in um, Arkansas. So what are you doing to enable the environment for angel investors to come to Well, let me hand on the on the VC, and then I think Kim can speak to those other ones pretty pretty well. Um, yeah, that, that's a challenge in Arkansas is trying to get capital into our state from you know from New York and from Silicon Valley. So uh, I think anything that you know 
the state has control of regulatory wise is, is to make the capital flow a little bit easier so you know lessening lessening a tax burden things like that can make a difference so we're, we're taking steps to to make that happen but then things like our accelerator program where we're bringing in companies from all over the country and at this point all over the world to come in and actually go through an accelerator program and then introducing them to the uh, to the mentors and, and there are you know there's some limited capital here with uh, companies like you know Stevens uh, with Simmons Bank and uh, FIS who sponsors one of our uh, um, uh, accelerators in Little Rock uh, they're seeing that there's opportunities so that was some of, one of the thoughts that we had when we, we created the accelerator program is um, what can we do that's different to a draw attention to Arkansas and through the accelerator program that the state is willing to put up two hundred fifty thousand dollars per accelerator that you know essentially that's money that's going to go out the door we don't there's no guarantee that we're going to see a return on that money we're just saying we're putting that in there to, to uh, attract people into the state and hopefully that they're gonna have such a good experience to meet so many good mentors and actually find some capital here and find the business that they need to partner with that they're willing to stay and eventually will realize the gains from uh, uh, from that company because they come here they create jobs here or they tell you know their their friend who's got a startup to come check out Little Rock so that's something that, that we're doing and Kim you can probably speak to what's going on with startup junkie and, mm -hmm. and how we partner yeah I'll just say the conductor is a partnership with with the University of Central Arkansas and startup junkie and a number of other community partners and sponsors so like I said the the Arkansas Economic Development Commission um, is a sponsor of ours to run our accelerator um, and we have a number of, of those so anything the conductor does by virtue of, of our doing that especially for free is because of all of the surrounding ecosystem that enables that to happen so we, we work closely with the AEDC and a number of other entities um, as far as in Africa, um, so and another another hat I wear is senior advisor to the Global Entrepreneurship Network, and through that we're able to kind of uh, work closely with a lot of people around the world. And actually, there's a gentleman from the Democratic Republic of the Congo who um, I met in South Africa, and he learned about one of our entrepreneurship programs that we do with high school students, and actually came to Arkansas, um, benchmarked the program, took the playbook to the Congo, replicated it there, reached 400 students there, and our you know conductor uh, program was then adopted into the international playbook to run in internationally so now that high school program is run all around the world so we do I'm passionate about working um, internationally in that regard and I'd say we you know admittedly we we haven't probably done enough in in Africa in my opinion uh, you know we are a small state only three million people I've only got a, a team of about a hundred people and only three are international offices so we're in, in Shanghai Tokyo and in Berlin um, when I was in Florida, we did you know a lot of, of work with Africa. We actually had an office in South Africa, so did a lot more there. But we, because we are a small state, we've had to be very targeted and where we're seeing the most investment from. But you know, as we get in the second you know uh, term for our current governor, uh, that might be something worth you know looking into and seeing. I know we've had good trade opportunities, you know, through our Department of Agriculture. There's been a lot of exchange, uh, but probably there's more that we could be done. Okay, one. Well, Uh, how do we evaluate startups? Um, we have a, a science and technology board, which you know Jeff uh, sits on. That they will. Oh, it's it, 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 we got a couple of different programs. So through our science and technology uh, authority, they have a, a couple of um, discretionary programs available. So um, they'll come in and, and evaluate the business plan. Is, is typically how they go through and do it. We have another uh, in, uh, investment tax credit program. We actually have a, a group from our our team that will sit down and hear a pitch from a company and evaluate you know their business plan and, and, and hear them out uh, and then we go back and you know kind of do our own research and due diligence on each one that we meet with and see uh, and then we're able to offer a, a tax credit that uh, um, can be offset with some equity awesome okay actually I have uh, one more question that we always ask at the end okay. and I want to ask you so that you have time to go relieve the nanny um, and, and Laura, um, we always end on what's one piece of business advice that you would leave us with tonight? One piece of business advice, um, and just one. <laughs> um, I'd say don't give up. Um, 
I know that that might sound a little cliche, but you know, so many times we see it. You know, companies that that come in and that have an idea and it just it doesn't work and it doesn't work. But if you have that that mindset and that passion for uh, doing business and, and growing and, and creating, you know, uh, wealth for yourself, uh, don't give up. Keep trying. Uh, I think that there's there's people out there that can help and support you and guide you along the way. So uh, don't give up. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for enabling this to happen, enabling that startup in the back of the room to grow a thousand percent. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.